welcome. Welcome, fellow Toastmasters and guests to this meeting of online presenters. It has begun. Yes, please note that in order to be a member of our club, you must be a current or former active member of Toastmasters International and have completed at least six Toastmasters official, official speeches or alternately, if you have substantial relevant presentation experience, you may apply for membership after demonstrating your ability in a two to three minute speech delivered during one of our club meetings. Our requests for membership are subject to approval by the members of our club. If you have not already done so, please change your panel to ensure it shows your name and role. If you have one, right click, select rename to do so. We have members and guests from many countries throughout the world. Thus, as a professional organization, we ask that you please be aware of language or words usage that may be considered offensive or otherwise insensitive due to cultural differences. Please note that we will be recording the meeting as you heard. Your video and audio contribution may be used for club marketing purposes. Also, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. We like to ensure that everyone gets heard and does not get interrupted. The man, the myth, the hybrid slash audio go-to legend, our president, Graham Kearns. Yay! <laughs> good morning, everybody, and welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I feel like Truman. Wherever you are, I hope you're having a fabulous day. And welcome to Online Presenters Toastmasters Club, our members and also our guests. I was just going through some paperwork and I noticed something that is really interesting, and that is that this club has received President's Distinguished Club, the highest level of recognition available, uh, in June 2018, June 2019, June 2020, June 2021, June 2022, and June 2023. Congratulations to all of our members for achieving the highest standard of recognition available to our clubs. I reckon that's pretty terrific. Oh, we've also, by the way, won the Smedley Award in 2017 and 2020, the Talk Up Toastmasters Award in 2019 and 2020, and the Beat the Clock Award in 2017 and 2020. So lots of awards for this club. But what more would you expect from one of the premier Toastmasters clubs around the world? This club is all about learning how to use this environment. No, no, not the beautiful blue skies behind me. That's an environment that I like, but that's not the environment that we use. No, using online presentation skills. I'm really looking forward to today's meeting because I know that today's meeting is going to be quite exciting. I'm not going to get laconic about it at all because I'm going to get enthusiastic. I'm not a Spartan. I'm more like an Athenian, although I do believe more in democracy than they did because their democracy was restricted only to uh, rich men, no women, no slaves, all that sort of stuff. But we're not going that way. We've got two formal presentations. We've got two formal evaluations. We've got a general evaluator, that's moi. We have a tip of the day. We have impromptu speaking. We have all singing, all dancing, a fabulous meeting. So I'm really looking forward to it. I make you most welcome here today. And I will now hand control of the meeting to our Toastmaster of the day, Kritika. All yours, Kritika. Oh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Gramps. So, I'm Pratika Devi Venkatram. I'll be the Toastmaster of the day. As an engaging MC, we will have a definitive reverberation of effective communication throughout our meeting. Today's meeting is organized into three sections, which Graham has already explained. It is going to be prepared speech and the impromptu pre speaking section of uh, table topics. The we end with an evaluation section. Having versatility in today's meeting is highly uh, important. That requires a focused team, and I have today a set of experienced Toastmasters to help me out to perform that. Before getting into the meeting, I would like to introduce the theme and word of the day. Sorry, Mr. Grammarian, let me please allow me to introduce the theme and word of the day. The theme for today is going to be. You said contagious, yes. Um, can you just confirm if you are able to see my screen? Yeah. Okay. 
The theme for today is contagiousness, corollaries, good articulation. I would also like to picturize the theme and the word of the day with a small depiction or with a small depiction and articulation that is projected over here. Leading without authority requires effective communication. And so that we build a magnetic pull that creates a resonating effect empowering our vocabulary. The choice of words play an important role in building emotional connect with the audience. Less the words, more the impact. Powerful and trenchant the descriptive, thought provoking and persuading the audience. Said so that the word of the day is laconic which means using less words to describe and communicate effectively. In this particular dis uh, articulation and the projection, I would like to introduce the EDA framework, which is used worldwide to, for, by the marketing professionals to capture the audience attention. We have 10 percentage of success that would be leaking out when we have a story sequel, a lengthy descriptive format that captures only 21% of the attention. Although we can capture or make them interested by providing an emotional connect using powerful words that builds the audience by 45%. We could also improvise by having a desire of 72% by giving the fact framework like IDA and many more irrelevant information that also adds value. What is the end result? Is the action taken by the audience, which is 100%. And I myself personally has, have encountered this where Toastmasters has redefined me to become one of the good orator and one of the good uh, speakers that makes me to stand before you as a Toastmaster of the day. So let's get into the meeting for today. Let's appreciate Today's speakers aggrandize laconically with trenchant verses. Okay, before we, act, before we get into the meeting, I would like to first introduce the ancillary roles played by today's Toastmasters. First of all, I would like to call upon uh, the our counter. Our counter Yoni Leda, would you like to introduce your role? Hello, I guess I'm the R counter. I thought the R counter was Joni. Here, there she is. She's back. Okay, good. There He's we go. Trying to get back the joy of temperamental technology. As the R counter, it will be my job to know the um uh er. Uh, long pauses, as well as pause fillers in our meeting. However, if I would like to be a counter, I would be happy to concede the role to him today. Would you like to be our counter, Mike? Mike, you're muted, but I think Mike was actually on the agenda. Um, but oh, we, but we Mike hadn't... arrived late. Okay, we well then, Mike, so in an know. attempt to back up because of technology, I will be happy to pass the role of our counter over to you. And if you want to explain again, feel free. There we go. I think I'm unmuted. Yeah. There we well, go. Well, the, the R counter yeah, has... Yeah. Yes, please. The, the R counter's role... I'm sorry, I had a lot of feedback going on, other people uh, uh, coming in. So the R counter's role... Uh, for me is probably the most important role of a meeting. I'm going to be listening very carefully to the words that we are using as bridges between thoughts. The us, the er, um, and uh, uh, things like that. I'm going to be counting those and I'm going to make a report at the end of the meeting to our Toastmaster. Thank you. Thank you, Toastmaster Mike. Next, I would like to introduce the time for today. The time for today is going to be Carolina Remains. Carolina, would you like to introduce your role? 
Yes, sure. My name is Carolina Ramirez. I will be the timer today. My role is to keep track of the time for all the speakers, prepare the speeches and impromptu speeches. And at the end of the meeting, I will give you my report. Be careful with time management. Back to you, Ms. Toastmaster. Thank you, Toastmaster Carolina. Next, next, I would like to introduce the watcher for today. Today's watcher is going to be David F. Carr. DTM David F. Carr, would you like to introduce your role? So we have a watcher in this club. Jim Barber sometimes describes the watcher as the visual grammarian. We're looking for the excellent uses of the visual frame, as well as the distracting, the unnecessary, or the you know, slight uh, visual full pause that might occur along the way. And I will give a report at the end of the meeting. Thank you, Toastmaster David. Next, I would like to call upon our chat monitor, Jim Barber. Would you like to explain your role, please? I'll be happy to, Madam Toastmaster. I wasn't aware I was the chat monitor, but I can do that. Uh, hi, everybody. As the chat monitor this evening, I will be, be, listen carefully now, this is rocket science, I will be monitoring the chat. I will be doing this for two particular reasons. One is to free up our Toastmaster, Krithika, so that she doesn't have to constantly monitor the chat. I'll let her know if something interesting pops up on the chat, but mostly I'm going to be watching it so that I can remind everybody at the end of the meeting if there was anything in the chat that they needed to make particular note of, and I'll report that at the end of the meeting. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Toastmaster Jim. That really helps me. So let's get into the uh, important section, the prepared speeches that, that will be performed by well-experienced speakers of today. First, we will have speech by Avi Hartman. Though I am not aware of the project details, I would just like to introduce her. Avi has been in Toastmasters for a long time. She has been married, and today she is going to talk about love, one of her favorite topics. The speech title for today is Turn Towards Kindness. Avi Hartman is a juvenile and shining Toastmaster, and I am looking forward for her speech. Over to you, Evie. Thank you very much, Kritika, for that warm introduction. Fellow Toastmasters, esteemed guests, thank you so much for being here. Tonight, I invite you on a little bit of a journey exploring an ingredient that could very well be the elixir of enduring love. When we think about enduring love, we might be thinking of passion, romance, compatibility. When pondering the idea of a relationship that lasts, we might think of romantic walks or candlelight dinners or surprise gifts or, you know, if you're a little farther along, things like consistently helping each other around the house. And while these are all facets of what love can be, there is an underlying force that determines the longevity and quality of any romantic or even non-romantic bond we have with another person. And I'd like to discuss tonight that based on extensive research, it's something profoundly simpler. Uh, Talita, I kind of grew up bouncing back and forth between two sides of my family. Let's call them kind of the A side and the B side. On the A side, it was full of type A personalities, social events, carefully constructed social dances, constant shifting of alliances, a lot of fun, yes, but also plenty of divorces. And on the B side, it was a bunch of dorky nerds that the A side constantly gave trouble to. It's very socially inept, uh, like my family. Uh, but my parents had a relationship that has lasted the test of time. They are always joking around and laughing with each other and they're genuinely happy. Divorce has never crossed their mind. And I was kind of fascinated looking back and forth between those two sides of my family when I was kind of coming of age and deciding what I wanted out of my own love in my life. And I felt very strongly about this. I really I wanted to have good social skills like one side of my family, but I didn't want to lose whatever it was that gave my parents' relationship that special magic touch. And so I didn't major in psychology. I didn't major in liberal arts, but I swear in college, I studied just as much about how to have good interpersonal relationships and a love relationship. 
almost as much as I studied biology. So when I was about to get married in 2014, uh, this research came out that just kind of made everything click into place. And it became immediately and is now up until this day, the single piece of advice that I would give somebody looking for love and trying to figure out what they want out of it. And that secret is not really a secret. It's just kindness, kindness and turning toward the other person. Uh, back in the day, psychologists from the U University of Washington embarked on a quest to study couples uh, and see what the difference was between couples that would eventually get divorced and couples that didn't. And they kind of identified two predominant types of couples. Uh, they colloquially called them the masters and the disasters. Uh, and what separated these groups was not their wealth or their looks or even mutual interests, but their level of responsiveness toward each other. And the insight was like gold. Basically, if if they were more likely to respond to their partner's bid for attention, even if it was just like, hey, look at that thing out the window, uh, a grunt and not much of a response is so incredibly different than a, oh, hey, what is that? That's cool. And sharing in that moment. Um, think about this. Have you ever done something uh, unintentionally that annoyed your partner uh, and we're getting getting back into kindness now uh, maybe you left the dishes out or forgot to call when you were late uh, now what if instead of assuming the worst your partner gave you the benefit of the doubt and that's generosity of spirit which is a foundational part of kindness and another facet of kindness that's often overlooked too too often overlooked because it's even more important is sharing in your partner's joy uh, oftentimes we think it's enough to be there during the lows and the hard times, but research shows that celebrating the highs together, the successes, it's even more crucial. Um, and how one reacts to their partner's good news is a strong indicator of the re relationship strength. Pardon me. A study in 2006 pinpointed four ways couples typically respond to good news, and the most beneficial and honestly, the kindest, is what they termed as active, constructive responding. This means genuinely engaging with your partner's happiness and celebrating it wholeheartedly. And couples who embrace this are much more likely to stay together and be one of the masters and not the disasters. Um, the researcher Gottman focused on the impact of this these couples' responses to each other. And even in the most mundane of circumstances or, so, or situations, and they found so much proof that active constructive responses to bids for attention fueled connection and fueled trust and just validation can take your relationship so far um i've got a bit of an acronym here to help you remember some core components of that it's uh fittingly give uh it's a very let's see it's a very laconic way to sum it up to sum up this concept first gentleness G-I-V-E. The first one is be gentle. We all respond more positively and less defensively when we're approached with gentleness. Um, without attacks or threats or judgments, giving the benefit of the doubt is so, so important. Interest. You've got to make them feel as if you are interested in what they have to say. Um, get off the phone. Just listen to what they're saying. Give that person space to communicate. Uh, basically, even if you want to go back to 1950 and look at the Miss Manners book, you'll see that the secret to good manners for anybody is simply putting people at ease. And the best way to do that is by acting interested. And number three and give, validate. Validate their emotions. Validate their desires. There's a kernel of truth to be found in every situation. And so if you can make people feel like they are being heard in that moment with you, that is incredible for your relationship. And E, use an easy manner. Be soft if you can, as soft as you possibly can. Lighthearted, smiling, using a gentle tone, relaxed. All of these have a psychological impact on both you and the partner that you're interacting with. And in conclusion, whether it's your partner or a friend or even a coworker, you've got to remember that power of kindness and just responding positively to those bids of attention. So next time you're tempted to react in annoyance or dismissively, even if you're just really, really not feeling it, there is so much power to choosing kindness and choosing to turn toward others.
It's the glue that binds us. It's the balm that heals us. And it's the force that can transform any relationship into something better. Thank you. Thank you, Prince Master Ruby. There was an emotional connect, and I could see the level of influence that you have with the emotional connect that you're that you're trying to build. Okay, let me get into the second speaker details. Uh, the speech is on the path visionary communications. The project is writing a speech with purpose on the topic surviving the AI. Apocalypse. Here we have Jim Barber, a versatile, experienced, well thought of Toastmaster that I have seen in my uh, career and experience. I would like to call upon Jim Barber for presenting his speech on the topic Surviving the AI Apocalypse. Jim Barber, over to you. Thank you so much. Madam Toastmaster of the evening, my fellow Toastmasters and our most welcome guests this evening. Last week, Angela spoke on artificial intelligence and basically the promise and potential that artificial intelligence offered us. Although I agree somewhat with what she said, actually, I feel that AI is going to be apocalyptic in its effects. Now, before I go any further, I should make sure that everybody understands the difference, what exactly apo the apocalypse really means. Apocalyptic means a massive change, as opposed to, for example, catastrophe, where catastrophe is a massive change that is bad. Apocalyptic is simply massive change that could be bad or it could be good, but it is simply an incredible change. And that is what AI is going to bring to us. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, I want you to use your imaginations or for some of our older members, your memories and go back pre-internet before the internet, before there was e-commerce, before there was online banking, before you could set, pay for things online with a credit card, before, you, we, before we had Amazon, before we had social media, before we had be the ability to place airline flights through your computer, the ability to do all of these different things were pre-internet. And that has changed. The, our world, I think you would agree, is dramatically different than it was before all of these things came about. However, the changes that the internet has brought have occurred over the last 20 to 30 years. The changes that AI is going to bring to us are going to be much more, much greater than the changes that the internet brought, and they're going to occur in the next five to seven years. Your lives, your daily lives, are going to be dramatically different in just a few years' time. To give you an example of how this is going to affect you individually, consider that, well, you've probably seen TV shows or something where somebody, if they're rich, they have a personal assistant, somebody to do things for them. AI is going to be your personal assistant. AI will do things for you. You want a reservation, you want something, you want almost anything. You just tell AI what you want and AI will take care of it for you. But that's not all. Some of us have, that. Well, those of us who have finances, have perhaps a financial advisor. You will have, everybody will have their own personal financial advisor giving them advice on their finances themselves. and. For that matter, health. Sorry about this, Andy, but doctors are going to be in real trouble because you're going to have a health coach. Everybody is going to have their own individual health coach that will give you health advice and guide you through your day. 
financial advice, health advice, relationship advice, as Edie was just talking about. All of these things AI is going to bring to us. Sounds marvelous, sounds wonderful, and it is. However, there's going to be some problems as well. A couple of the problems are, for example, massive unemployment. Now, as Angela pointed out, AI is going to create new jobs. Yes, it will. However, AI is going to create far fewer jobs than it's going to abolish. For every 10 jobs that AI gets rid of, it's going to create one. What are we going to do with those other nine people? Massive unemployment, and it's coming in the next few years. Also, another big problem is AI ethics. What's the problem here? AI doesn't have any. That is, it does have ethics, but it has the ethics that you program into it. Now, of course, as long as we're dealing with the, say, the United States government or with benevolent companies, we're sure that they're not going to do anything that would be immoral or improper. And so their AI ethics, we're quite sure, is going to be fine. But there are going to be governments around the world who maybe don't share our moral standards, and they are going to be able to develop AI just as easily as we do. And those ethics are going to be in conflict with ours. This is a problem that we have not figured out an answer to yet. There are others, but the whole thing is there is no way to avoid AI. AI is like a force of nature. It's like a tsunami. You can run from it, perhaps, but you're not going to be able to run very far. Best thing to do is, if it's a tsunami, grab a, grab a, a, a surfboard and surf your way through it. The trick to using AI is to, do, the trick to beating AI is to not try to beat it. You can't. AI is already smarter, it's more accurate, it's more reliable, it's more consistent than a human being. When it comes to logic, when it comes to memorization, AI beats it. And so we have been studying all our lives from the earliest grades, we've been studying the three R's. I think everybody focuses on that, reading, writing, arithmetic, which is logic and memorization. And AI can beat us on all of those areas. The thing that we have got to do, and we've got to do it very quickly, is to develop the three I's. Imagination, intuition, ingenuity, the I's have it because these are the things that AI cannot do. AI cannot guess. AI has no intuition. AI has no hunches or gut feelings. AI cannot fantasize and AI cannot dream. And it is in doing these things that we can beat AI, but it is not by trying to go against AI toe to toe because that is a battle that we cannot win. And that, my friends, is the AI apocalypse that will be upon us very soon. I urge you to get prepared. Madam Toastmaster. That's persuading. And the level of crowdsourced information with your insights throws real apocalypse and haunting horror effect to everybody when we think about AI. Yes, it is good in some sense. Yes. Okay. So the prepared section, prepared speeches section is over for today. And we do have the voting section, which will be open. Our OTA will post you the, the best speaker for today and kindly vote for the best speaker. Meanwhile, we had a prepared TTM to be conducted by Andrew Burn. As he is unavailable and he mentioned that during the start of the meeting, we have one another uh, exclusive TTM here. And it's Mariam who's going to conduct the table topics for today. The table topics for today would be conducted by Mariam. And over to you, Mariam. Why, thank you, Karthika. So nice to be here with you. Tonight, I was just kind of tossed into this role, so I am doing it like off the cuff, and I hope you'll participate. Now, 
I am going to choose different people and I have a bunch of random questions and I would like to invite Carolina to tell us, let me see, how did you meet your best friend? Hello, everyone. The question is, how, how did I meet my best friend? Yes. Uh, I used to have a best friend, but I believe that I don't have a best friend anymore. I have many best friends. Maybe not many, maybe two or three, but I used to have one best friend forever when I was a child. I met her when I was 11 years old. We used to be together in a school. We, are very, we were very close and I have very good memories about her. However, we started to grow and our path started to separate uh, because we started to change, to see life in a different way. And today we are, we are still friends, but we don't have much uh, things to talk about, many things in common. That's very strange how people change, but um, it was a very good experience. And I learned that I prefer to have more than one best friend. And, and I, I feel more free in that way. Back to you, Marianne. Well, thank you so much. Now, I would like to invite Joni to tell us what is your hidden talent? I have so many, and I kid you not. <laughs> for those of you who are here for my, I'm mad at Disney, Disney. They tricked me, tricked me, had me wishing on a shooting star. Would know that I'm capable of hitting a note if I put my mind to it. I am also a visual, just kidding, wordsmith artist. I can pen a tale like no one's business to craft in the imagination the envisionment and embodiment of what I feel inside. I have many hidden talents. A couple of them, Toastmasters are, is a professional organization, so I wouldn't be able to share that in public. But I can say that that's the beauty of being human. But my most important talent, and the one that I love the most about me, is I can do anything I put my mind to. I genuinely believe that I can do anything that I put my mind to. Here's the thing. It's about being able to put my mind to it. Overall though, other than hitting a note, being able to craft with words my emotional state or to paint a picture that others can relate to, anything I can put my mind to. Back to you, our Tabletop Topics Master. Well, thank you so much. And I knew that about you. You have tons of hidden talents. Next, I would like to ask David Carr, what would you do if you won the lottery? What would I do if I won the lottery? Madam Table Topics Master, fellow Toastmasters, Masters, welcome guests. Yes, I'm just stalling. What would I do if I won the lottery? I I think I would have uh, my house revamped from from top to bottom, um, and uh, cleaned and polished and painted, and uh, all the uh, home improvement projects or just simple home repair projects that I haven't gotten around to would be all wiped away. I'd be starting with a a clean slate a clean office, and it would be glorious for about a week until I, I started cluttering up the place again. But 
it is a nice fantasy to have that we'd have a fresh start. We'd have it all new, all fresh, all brightly painted, all polished, and ready to go into the future. Madam Topics Master. Oh, and then you can come over and take care of some of the projects in my house, too. <laughs> All right, next, I would like Mr. Mike Woodall to pick up an object on your desk and show it to us, please. Oh, God, there's so many. Okay, what I'd like you to do is sell that item to the rest of us. Well, thank you, Madam Topic Master, for that a magnificent question. Now, I would offer this as for sale, but this is not for sale. So there is no money that can purchase this. This is the greatest uh, thing that I have bought, or I have, I didn't buy it, that I've had in, uh, well, forever. You know, I left an iced tea in this canister on my kitchen counter. Three days later, I opened it up and the ice was still in there in the iced tea. Now that was three days. Now the reason, and that's the reason it's the finest that I've ever had and I could never sell it. The reason I could never sell it is because it's not mine. I was having a beer down at the pub about uh, six months ago. And a friend of mine by the name of R.A. Wilson left it there on the bar. So I thought, well, I'm going to see him sometime or another. And I haven't seen Bob yet, Bob Wilson. I haven't seen him in a while. So I pulled it out of the counter, uh, out of the kitchen counter, uh, and I started using it. And I'll tell you what, Bob, you may not be getting it back. Madam Topic Master. Wow, there's a friend selling his friend's cup. Oh my goodness. Next, I would like to invite our guest, um, George. Would yes, you mind answering a question tonight? Of course, Madam. Can you yeah. please describe your dream vacation? My dream vacation would be to be in Bahamas right now relaxing and preparing for a conference. Sadly, I cannot do that. So I have to have more modest and realistic dreams, like listening to the conference online while sipping a coffee in the middle of the winter. I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And if I don't drink hot coffee, I freeze because it's winter. It's winter and that's not the ideal holiday I had envisioned. On the other side, being in the Caribbean, being in Bahamas, listening to beautiful speeches, listening to beautiful tutorials, mingling with beautiful people. Some of you are going to be there. I'm going to miss meeting you. How can I cope? Well, the power of imagination. I will be in some online meetings. I will be listening to some of the online sessions. And yes, I may be sunbathing in the terrace in a mild winter. Day. So thank you for your question, madam. Well, thank you. Well, it's very hot summer where I am, but I am still drinking hot drinks because my husband keeps the air conditioner so cold in the house. Uh, let's see, I have another. Let me see. Graham. What is the best way to fill an awkward silence? Oh, you want me to actually fill the awkward silence? I do apologize, Madam Topics Master. Yes, awkward <laughs> silences are terrible. I acknowledge that. But I would say 
those of you who know me would know that I think the best way to fill an awkward silence is to fill it with dad jokes. And I have, I have not one, not two, not five, but an entire year's worth of dad jokes on a calendar, which my son gave to me. I'm not going to repeat some of them. I mean, they're terrible. Things like I've been run over by the same bike three times this week. It is a vicious cycle. Or uh, I invented a rocking chair with a wheelchair hybrid. It's rock and roll. No, I'm not going to fill them with dad jokes because I have, in fact, decided not to run joke lie anymore. For, for those of you who don't follow me on Facebook, well, you're probably wise. Uh, for the last 10 years, I have done joke lie and dad December. That is every July and every December, I would tell a dad joke every day on Facebook. Uh, well, after 10 years, I've decided that joke lie has to be retired. And so... It, at the end of last month, I stopped selling dad jokes. I did think about adding in uh, awful gust or, or jest, whatever you preferred to call August, but my wife threatened to divorce me. So instead, I have decided no more dad jokes. Instead, I'm going to just keep rambling whenever people ask me a question. For example, I was asked a question about how to fill an awkward silence. And the thought came to me that if I just kept talking, that sooner or later, my talking would be more awful and more awkward than the silence would have been, which means that I should shut up. But I can't do that because if I were to shut up, then there would be this awful, awkward silence. So instead, I've decided I'm going to speak more slowly. I'm going to be more laconic about the way that I speak. My accent is going to become more like a real Queensland accent. I'm from Queensland, which is, oh, call it the Florida of Australia, and we can be as laconic as you like, but I've got a red light. There's no awkward silence left. So, Madam Topics Master. Well, thank you kindly, sir. And at this point, um, we've had our impromptu speakers, and I think we're wrapping up right now. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. That was a wonderful section. I, I really enjoyed uh, with the impromptu speeches and the speakers with the presence of mind and the presentation that they've done. Okay. Can we get a uh, timer let's, report, perhaps? Let's... Let's quickly understand the eligibility of the speakers as well as we will have the opening session to be posted in the chat. Speakers and fellow Toastmasters, please vote for the best speaker for today's impromptu speech. Okay. Getting into our evaluation section, we have the most experienced DTM. General Evaluator Graham. If I mention your name right, I'm, I'm in a good state. Okay, well, that's wonderful to see your reaction. Yes, I mentioned your name right. Okay, over to you, General Evaluator Graham. Thank you, Kritika. I'm sorry, I put the R at the wrong point in your name, and I do apologize, but thank you, Kritika, our Toastmaster for the day. I am the General Evaluator. My job is to lead the evaluation oh. section of the meeting. But we have a tip of the day that we have not yet heard. And since I'd like to also be able to evaluate that tip as part of my role as general evaluator, I'm going to call on Joni Laidlaw DTM, who's an even more experienced DTM than me, to present the tip of the day. So for five minutes, I believe, Joni, uh, if I can have lights at uh, three, four and five, please, Madam Timekeeper. Here's Joni Laidlaw with the tip of the day. Yay! Thank you so much, General Evaluator Graham Carnes. Today, as promised the last time I did a Pathways Overview, we are going to be signing off a project. Now, why is this important? The first time I broke the Toastmasters website, I mean, I went on and it froze for me. I was trying to actually sign off a project. Now, exactly what happened and why did I feel like I broke Toastmasters? Well, simply put, nobody said to me that, and remember, there's a before and an after as it relates to your assessment. So I went through, this was in the old days back in 2019, before COVID, when 
nobody was as much on online and everybody was complaining they want to got, get back to the legacy program and where is the manual and me going, I'm glad there was no manual because I would make it as a Toastmaster. But I logged on. And when I logged on and I went through the system, I was so happy to see all of the wonderful things that were there. The only thing is that when I got to the end right here that says your evaluation, and I said, okay, I'm going to move on to my next step, which was basically to sign off my project. Well, guess what? I did. I went in and I did my assessment. I mean, after all, I am confident and calm when speaking in front of groups. Hell no, one. I did it, but I wasn't. I understand the structure of a basic speech. Considering I was told that I was rambling and going off on a tangent. Two, I am aware of my strengths as a communicator and leader. Well, duh, I knew that before I came to Toastmasters. That's a fact. I am aware of where I need to improve my communication, listening, thinking, and speaking, and leadership skills. What am I put right there? What must I put there? If I knew that, I wouldn't be at Toastmasters. Come on. What? Context. So since I don't know, I'll put a one. And I hit submit. I was finished. Yay, me. I'm done. Why is there no little tick? Why can't I find the tick? It was driving me absolutely crazy. Now for anybody who's met me, I know it's hard to believe, but I can be just a little erratic when I cannot figure out what is happening. Just a little. They said, when you sign off, you're supposed to see a blue tick. I remember that. I made note of it. This was pre the days of that cute little video that you just saw that said how to sign off. And I went just a little bit, a little bit erratic, could not figure out what I was doing. I called my mentor, Stacy. I broke Toastmasters. I told you I was going to do it and I told you you should have stayed with me because I broke it. She responded, Johnny, I highly doubt that you broke Toastmasters. Explain what's happening. Okay, so I entered the thing and I pressed submit, but it's not showing the little tick and I don't know what to do. Now, this was before we had this cute little icon here that would allow you to maneuver through the space. And she said, are you sure you signed everything off? Uh, huh? Go back over and retrace your steps. Okay. Back, 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 back. But did I mention this was before the time when we had this cute little icon here that you could just skip to your before assessment? Well, now that's there, so I can make it easy for everyone. If you sign off your project and you find that you're not seeing that little blue tick, all you have to do, go to your before assessment. You're actually supposed to check it off before you do your speech to state how comfortable you are. And then the after assessment would be for you to basically give a rundown that, phew, now that I've done it, this is how I feel about myself. Now, when I just started out, <clears throat> My before assessments were awesome. And I was quickly humbled with the afters. So bear in mind that an assessment doesn't always have to be, hey, I was great, I'm a five. And after I'm still great and I'm a five. It's a tool to let you know what you need to improve maybe for the next time you do the speech or to ask your vice president education, do you mind if I do this again? Or the next time around, when you do your next task, you get the opportunity to, based on your before and after assessment, choose a path that will highlight what you missed in the first. Back to you, our general evaluator. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you very much um, for that. Sorry to interrupt. And thank you, Johnny. It's wonderful to have your tech, tech tip. And I would like to hand over the session to the general evaluator who will conduct the evaluation section with the ancillary roles played by one, uh, all of the evaluators over here. 
thank, thank you, you Tony, and thank you gentle evaluator over to you thank you Kritika. thank you for that let's move on to those evaluations we won't get a formal evaluation of Joni's presentation although i will give one as part of my general evaluation what we will have is a formal evaluation of our two speakers and looking at my agenda we have two evaluators well here you go the first of those is evaluating our first speech and of course the first speech today was by evie hartman to provide his evaluation of Evie's presentation, will you please make welcome for a period of two to three minutes with indications at two, two and a half and three, please, Madam Toastmaster, uh, Madam Timekeeper. Here's Toro Moriyama. Toro, your evaluation, please. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. What a fantastic speech it was. Thank you, Toastmaster Hartman for your wonderful speech. You are full of spirit, unleashing your energy and a passion and inspired us a lot. I was fascinated by your presentation. Uh, let me explain three beautiful points and allow me to present my three humble suggestions. First, beauty was articulation. It was clear, flawless, and straightforward, plus good rhythm. The second is confidence. She talked as if she was having a conversation with a close friend. So that give us, gave us a sense of uh, engagement and intimacy. Third, your message. Everything she talked boiled down to the core message, which is kindness is the most important and decisive thing to build an eternal bond between the people. I can agree, and so does everybody else, I'm sure. And that was a well-planned and well-structured message. I was impressed very much. So let me turn to my two humble suggestions. First, I think you need to speak slowly sometimes so that the important part could reach the audience well. And in order to do this, it might be better to use a pose. For example, when you say your core message, what is the most needed thing to build a good relationship with others? It is simple. Pose, very long pose, kindness, just simple as that. The idea is to give the audience a time to think and digest your thought and create a sense of suspense. Then you can make your speech more engaging and impressive. Second, stronger finish. To make your message more powerful, it might be better if you emphasize the closing remarks by using a big gesture, an exaggerated vocalization. In summation, Articulation, uplifting message, plus an effective use of pose and stronger finish would make your speech perfect. And I'm sure you can do it and will inspire us and entertain us more than today. Next time, back to General Evaluator. Thank you, Moro. Thank you for Toro, Toro, sorry, Toro Moriyama. Thank you for that evaluation of Evie. Our second speaker today was uh, Jim Barber and providing an evaluation of Jim is Marianne Gray again for two to three minutes. Marianne, the floor is yours. Why, good evening again, fellow Toastmasters. It is my pleasure to give you the evaluation for Jim's speech, AI Apocalypse. I love this topic. It's so relevant in these days. And he spoke about Angela's speech and the potential and promise AI has. I did not see Angela's speech, so I didn't have a reference for that particular point. Uh, but 
I loved your phrase, apocalypse versus catastrophe. And you gave us a little history asking us to remember a dramatically different time in our world. You referred to the internet. Uh, you, you talked about you know, going down memory lane on those things. And then you went and talked about how the AI is different and it will change the world in a much bigger way, laying the foundation for our future. I personally think it's a little scary. So when I hear all these things, I am very nervous about AI. So one of the things um, you told us to look at, uh, let's see, was you talked about advice, your personal assistance, then you said the financial advisor, then you said the ho health coach, and then you called out to Andy Burns, sorry, Andy, which that he's a doctor, so that makes sense, and it's a great way to engage the office, um, the audience. You also referred to the relationship advice and made a reference to Evie speech. Again, another great reference pulling the audience in with you. When you spoke about unemployment, you said 10 jobs would be lost for every one created by AI. I personally would like to hear where you got that information because if I wanna understand about that and I am somebody who does stay on top of like the job market and uh, that would be a great site for me, a place to go look up further information. Right now with AI, the genie is out of the bottle. And so while I felt a little nervous as we were coasting along through your speech, at the end, you did give us hope. Uh, you said, um, let's see, I'm losing my place, sorry about that. You talked about imagination, intuition, and ingenuity, and that, you know, you could, they didn't have uh, no hunches or, you know, gut feelings, and so that we are still important and that we could still maintain our place. One other thing that I didn't see that you mentioned in your speech though, and I would have liked to hear a little bit more, and it is one of my biggest concern, is loss of skills uh, for people. You know, people aren't going to have writing skills or thinking skills or logic skills because they are totally relying on this. And they rely on this thing. I mean, Angela coined a term called entrepreneurs. They're writing books like this. So I think that is another big thing that uh, makes me nervous again. But I, I am fascinated by this topic. I thought it was well done, Jim. And, um, you know, thank you. And I look forward to your next one. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Uh, I was watching the lights. They both speakers appeared to be within time. So uh, both evaluators. So we will get a link for the two evaluators and you can vote for the best evaluator as well. I assume they were both within time, weren't they, uh, Carolyn? Yes, I see a nod. Good. OK, so that'll come up in a moment. So when that does, please vote for your best evaluator. I'll give an evaluation of the evaluators a little later, but I'm going to now move on to some of the ancillary roles. And we are, yeah, we're doing OK for time, but I'd still like everybody to try to keep within about a minute for your reports if you can. The first of our functionary roles, if you like, uh, is the timer. And uh, Carolina, do you want to give us a report on how we've gone for time thus far this evening. Uh, yes, do you want me to report every time? So every, yeah, do more. The time for every speaker? Yes, why not? You've been working furiously all night, so you might as well get some cuter <laughs> Okay, score. Evie, seven minutes and 15 seconds. Jim, seven minutes and 10 seconds. Johnny, one minute and 24 seconds. David, one minute and... 04 seconds, Mike, one minute and 30 seconds, George, one minute, Graham, two minutes. And for evaluators, Toru, three minutes and 24 seconds, and Marianne, three minutes and 19 seconds. That's my report. Fabulous. All, everyone is qualified. Everybody is um, qualified. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 78% uh, of statistics on the internet are made up. I like that. Thank you, Jim. Moving on now to our second uh, functionary. I, I'm not sure that hunk functionary is the word I would use. Ancillary uh, participant, the grammarian. George, you are our guest grammarian tonight. Observations from you. Yes, I would like not to be laconic myself, but I'm overwhelmed by the quality of the language. 
I noted nice pieces of language, like the bond that heal us, the facets that love can be. I like um, uh, the genie out of the bottle, tons of expression. I have marked a couple of things that I would pose to your consideration because it didn't sound right to me, but I'm not 100% sure. Kirthika said, less the words, the better. And I think it's fewer the words, the better because words are countable. I think that sounds better. I have another example of um, Jim not using a hyperbole, is actually saying that apocalyptic is greater than catastrophic. And that was brilliant because as a speaker, we usually use hyperbole. This is a real thing. It is going to be apocalyptic. I found another case where Carolina was telling a story about how she grew. And when she grew, she had used a lot of words to describe separating from her best friend. And that's when in English, we replace a whole bunch of words with fewer words. And that could have been said, we just grew apart, pause. Instead of the longer explanation saying that she got separated after growing up. I want to congratulate Graham because not only he said laconic a couple of times, but he actually did it, he performed it. And it's a very good thing for speakers to showcase what something looks like when they know how to do it. And they, he did it on purpose and that was brilliant. They found one more thing uh, when Evie Hartman was talking about the kinds of love and the kindness of love, I heard a kind of identified which I hope the accountant may tell me if it's right or wrong, but it sounded weird to me. And I think it's the word that stick one times too many, once too many. That's my report. I congratulate the club on the, on the language. It's absolutely magnificent here. It's so a pleasure to be here listening to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you very much for your grammarian's report. Actually, I realized when I was speaking earlier, I made a, a, a laughing reference to Sparta and Athens. And I suddenly realized that unless you happen to be a scholar of ancient Greece, you may not know where the word laconic comes from. The area of ancient Peloponnesia that Sparta is based in is Laconia and the Laconians the Spartans and their surrounds were particularly noted for being quite brusque and short with their speech. So next time you speak, talk of somebody being laconic, they're actually being Spartan and they're being very sharp with their words. There you go. Moving on now to the watcher and our watcher is David Carr. David, how did we do today in terms of use of the environment? Sure. Sometimes in this role, we spend some time talking about the use of presentation technologies, visual special effects. My favorite special effect of the evening was actually this smile uh, right here. And so I thought that Evie gave a charming delivery. Uh, she looked, she was smiling. And sometimes there's a little bit of a shy look too, but, but it, was, it, was, it was charming. She was communicating to us, I think, the, the emotional importance of what she was speaking about. For the most part, I think she kept good eye contact with us, although I think it's sometimes she was glancing at some notes off to the side. And I think we're, we're more tempted to do that when we're sitting in front of a computer uh, and speaking than we might be up in front of a group of people, but it's almost more obvious when you're glancing over just because of the perspective of your, your head turning that way. So uh, there are sneaky things that people have figured out how to do, uh, tacking the, the uh, notes up behind the monitor, things like that, so that maybe people wouldn't know that you were reading when you do need to read. But in general, it's, it's good to try and know the material well enough that you don't have to. Enough said about that. I think the, the only other one that I really made some notes on was Joni when she was doing her table topic, I thought had some nice crisp use of, uh, of hand gestures. Sometimes I'm told that when I'm in this environment, I'm doing hand gestures, but people can't see them. They only see like one finger over the side. And so 
you know, she she used good hand gestures and she got them into the camera frame. Those are the things that jumped out at me the most, Mr. Grammarian. Thank you, David, and thank you for some good advice there. Uh, by the way, Evie, in case you're wondering about how to use notes on a large monitor, I, if I have to read, put it into Word, shrink it down to about that big so that there's only two paragraphs per open block and put that directly under the camera, which means that I can be reading directly from what looks like the camera. It's a way of cheating. So if you've got a big monitor, just shrink Word down until you've only got two paragraphs in your little block of, and shove it directly under your camera. It cheats, but it works. Moving on to our next ancillary role, and that is the R counter. Mm, Mike Woodall, how did we go? Thank you for giving me a little uh, ear presentation there. Uh, you know, I want to thank every every one of you, all of my Toastmasters team, uh, for giving me this opportunity to count all the ahs and us in this meeting. You guys kept me on my toes. I'm going to go through rather quickly, so just listen. And I'm not going to be giving any examples. Uh, maybe one. Evie, you had 20 us. 20 ands, two so's, Kurthika, I apologize if I mis mispronounced your name, and you had six ands, one so, three us, and two and so's. Jim Barber, you had so three times, but one time, but you used it appropriately. Marianne, so two times, and so two times, uh, eight times, and six times, but three times. Uh, Jim Barber. You had three so's. Use but appropriately. Marianne, we did that one, Jim Barber, okay. Carolina. Carolina, you had one a, uh, eight ands, two buts. Joni, you had one a, uh, but it was the only time I ever heard a uh, used appropriately. And five times, David Carr, you had a perfect score until the final time you spoke. You had four us, uh, two so's, five ands. George. One so, two us, one but, and two ands. Graham, you had seven ands, one but, one and so, three so's. Toru, you had five ands, no buts, us, or so's. And the only example I will give is in your evaluation, your eloquent evaluation, I might say, you said clear and straightforward when it could have been clear, straightforward without the use of the end. The pause that you speak of could have been inserted there. Thank you, General Evaluator. Thank you, Mike, for that comprehensive review of our ands, buts, so's, and etc. Anybody here hate the, uh, not the, the R counter themselves, but the role of R counter? I'm not a great fan of it, but I have to tell you, I did do some research, which I've just placed into the chat. It works. It actually teaches us to use it does. fewer filler words. What works even more, and I really hate this, is a an audible cue when we're doing it as, as we're speaking, hearing somebody go ding on a glass. Doesn't work in this environment because the timing's wrong, but I really hate that. It distracts me, but it stops you doing it. Anyway, leaving all of that aside, we've been through the R counter time now for the, what, what came after the R counter? It says here that we have the chat monitor and that would be the very chatty Jim Baba. Yes, Mr. General Evaluator, I'm doing this too late to get credit for it, but I'm going to say it anyway. My presentation will be laconic. 
There was nothing of historical note in the chat. We used it for what its general purpose for communication purposes, and we did it well. But as I say, there was really nothing that needed to be recorded. However, on the possibility that there is something there that a hidden gem that you might want to refer back to later. I remind everybody that saving the chat is incredibly easy. Click on the three dots at the bottom of the chat window and then save chat. You don't waste any electrons. You don't waste any trees. Everything is straightforward. I would urge you to do that. Back to you, Mr. General Evaluator. Thank you, Jim. Talking of electrons, did you hear about the proton who walked into a uh, hotel and went up to the reception and they said, where's your baggage? And they said, oh, I'm traveling light. Sorry. Um, time now to do my <laughs> boom. Time for my general evaluation. First up, I want to make some comments about the evaluators tonight. And I commend both of our evaluators who I believe did a really good job. Except there is one thing that I would draw to the attention of any evaluator. Can I ask Evie, what was the nature of your project? What was the the project that you did, uh, the path and and level? I'll tell you later. Uh -huh. You've forgotten. Well, the thing is, I know that you did tell the evaluator that because I remember seeing it, but I can't find it anywhere. But the evaluator did not refer to that. So we do not know whether you actually met the objectives that you were setting to yourself. Now, in the case of Jim's presentation, which was uh, do a speech, write a speech with purpose. We knew what the purpose of Jim's presentation was. That was relatively easy. We could see that. I'm not entirely sure what you were trying to achieve with your speech. And I genuinely believe in Toastmasters, as opposed to in the wider world, in Toastmasters, we really should, as evaluators, at least make reference to the objectives of the presentation so that it focuses our mind on whether we achieve that. Really good, by the way, in one of the evaluations to speak about the use of pace and pause, not only saying it would be effective to pause here, but more importantly, why it would be effective to pause here, because not only should we look for specifics and evaluations, but we should say both what the speaker should do slash has done well and why they should do that slash why it is a good thing. So what and why? And uh, I'd like to commend both of our evaluators for doing that. One observation I would make for all evaluators, don't rehash the speech. And if you're in a debating club, you know that you're not allowed as third speaker, which is the equivalent position of the evaluator, to add new material. That's not your job. It's not your job to say, I wish this had been included in this presentation. So don't add new material, don't rehash the speech, just speak about how effective the presentation was. For the Toastmaster today, I thought a, a really interesting role as Toastmaster today. Uh, now, uh, Kritika, this was your, it's certainly your first time as Toastmaster in this club. Uh, was this your first time in being Toastmaster for a while? This is my second Toastmaster uh, role in my entire life. Right. Well, well done. I enjoyed the fact that you kept us moving. You kept us moving along. And I know that in the background, we've all heard the analogy of the duck, which looks like it's just floating along uh, on the surface. But you know that underneath they're paddling away furiously. Well, Kritika, Kritika and I were having quite a lot of chats privately about what was going to happen and where things were going to be because changes were happening on the fly. Well done on that. The one thing I would say, not just for Kritika, but for all members, is that this club does not have a lot of fat in its agenda timing. We are, for example, 90 seconds away from when the meeting is due to close, and I haven't yet called for guest comments. When you are the Toastmaster, sometimes those brilliant ideas that we have, like, for example, the opening that Kritika had there, maybe we don't have time for those. Maybe we should keep those for a separate presentation where we are given five to seven minutes to do it. So just an observation. I think that after we started to run behind a little, we caught up, we worked it around, well done. And I enjoyed, I really did enjoy the job that Kritika did. Just in general terms for all of us, our job as Toastmaster of the day is not to be the star. It is simply to be the glue that holds the meeting together. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope everybody else enjoyed it. I'm pretty sure our guests did. And hello, Andrew. <laughs> uh, you suddenly magically appeared there. 
I have nothing else as general evaluator, so I'll now hand control of the meeting back to our Toastmaster of the evening, Pratika. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator. It was insightful and I would take your uh, comments for de definitely. Okay, so to end up today's meeting, using there are like paradox of words and jargons which is there. How do we use the word laconically makes us most relevant and significant. Like Ernest Hemingway has stated, the six-worded sequel where he, is, he has marketed the importance of using less words uh, in his campaign. I would also like to learn and appreciate being laconic in the way that we move forward. Okay, I think we are at the end of the section and we had, a. I really enjoyed today's meeting and I hope everybody would have done, everybody would have enjoyed like me. And I would also welcome the guest, guest George Cheeser. Would you like to say some words about our meeting and the presentation that has happened today? I'm going to use fewer words than I intended. This was a brilliant meeting and I recovered time for the meeting. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for your comments. So, and our uh, DDM Andrew is back. Andrew, hi. Would you like to have some words for us today?